Hi there. Welcome back to The Fuse Show. I'm your host, David Tran. I'm also the co-founder of Exfusion.io. Today, I'm joined by Nora Shields. She's the co-founder of Rock Paper Coin, the first software platform to bring together wedding planners, couples, and vendors into one system for managing and paying contracts and invoices. She's also the founder and lead wedding designer or wedding planner of award-winning firm Bridal Bliss. Thanks for joining us on the show, Thanks Nora. Thanks so much for having me on. So I've taken a look at your profile. I've noticed that you spent 19 years at uh, Bridal Bliss. And I think out of all the guests I've had on the show, that's a, that's a record. I think <laughs> most people don't stay at the same place for a long time. So you must be, you must really enjoy it or you must be really passionate about um, it. Can you, can you tell me about yeah, that? Yeah, I think it's both. I, um, I started Bridal Bliss right out of college. I actually um, submitted the business plan to a competition through, I went to Gonzaga University and I submitted the business plan and actually won. And the deal was hmm. if you started, you got double the amount of funds. Otherwise it was just like a, a cash prize, which is exciting either hmm. way. So I was a college graduate. I literally had nothing to lose. I came home to Portland. I was living with my parents for a couple of years, you know, like so little expenses. Um, and so I just like took the plunge and did it and learned by trial and error um, I had attempted to find a job in the industry. I'd, I'd worked in different aspects of the wedding industry. I had, you know, worked for a caterer, worked for a flower shop. So I had like somewhat of a background in events, but I had never planned a full event by myself. Hmm. And so I just um, did it and made a lot of mistakes and, and learned along the way. So um, that's kind of how it started. And it was very much slow growth for us. We, um, it was just me for the first couple of years. Then we brought on assistants. Then we brought on full time employees. So um, it was it was slow and steady rather than kind of jumping in and getting really big really fast. Is that company one that you started? Did you plan your first wedding prior to? Bridal Bliss, or was that your experience first dive into no, planning I weddings? I did for like a family member, and I had done okay. events like at school and, and things like that. But like professionally, um, I'd never been hired for a wedding before I started the company. Was it scary doing your first wedding? It was scary, but it was exhilarating. Like I remember <laughs> I um, I'm a total newbie, like, you know, had never worked an event on site all day. I made the mistake of wearing really cute high heels and at the end of the night, it felt like my feet were bleeding, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I remember talking on the phone. I was still there. I was sitting like on the stairs in the back room. I remember it like it was yesterday and just telling her how much fun it was and I was tired, but I was excited and um, it was, it was the great start. So how do you know that you wanted to continue after your first one goes to the next one goes to the next one? Like, how do you know you want to make it a business instead of just being a freelancer? I just enjoyed it. And after the first couple weddings, I got many, many referrals. Um, I started hmm. in 2002. So at that point, there weren't a ton of wedding planners around and word got around quick. I was at the age when a lot of my friends were newly engaged. So word spread pretty quickly and the wedding industry lives off personal recommendations and referrals. So um, I actually mm. spent the first couple months as a business owner just meeting as many wedding vendors as I could. So I toured venues, I talked to florists, I met with caterers um, just to, you know, meet as many people as I could to like know who to refer to, number one. But in turn, those people would also refer business to me. So it was kind of a win-win. Did you just like go down the list of every, every like yeah. vendor in the area based on Google Maps? Totally. Okay. All right. Totally. All right. And I would have like four or five meetings a day. I would just drive around town and you're exhausted by the <laughs> end, but, um, it was a, a great way to, to meet so many people. And, you know, I didn't really have many bookings at that time. So mm -hmm. I had the time to spend doing it and I kept in touch. Some of them I still work with today. So, um, it was, it was definitely well worth the time investment. How did you, how, how long did you do that before, but before you started having a steady stream of customers? Probably only like a year. I, the first couple oh. of years, um, I probably doubled in size and then it, it went up from there. So, um, I, mm. at the point I really needed help was probably 
three, three to four years in where, um, you know, in, in the Pacific Northwest, there are only so many months throughout the year where you can have an outdoor wedding and that's always the most mm. popular thing. So we would get inquiries and I'd be booked and we're on site at every single event. So when you have a, a event on a certain day, you can only do that one. And so I brought on assistants to, um, to run different events that I still planned everything, but they were on site mm. executing and, um, doing it ended up being I would do like 30 to 40 weddings per year just myself and that is enough to make somebody go crazy really fast and so I imagine I imagine. yeah it's just a lot of details and especially if you're at an event and there's another coordinator that's calling you to ask questions about another one that's going on it's just too much so um plus it's you're on your feet for 12 sometimes up to 16 18 hours a day for just executing this one event. So it's it's hard on your body, it's hard on your brain. Um, so I ended up hiring coordinators that once a client would be booked, that coordinator would take the reins, plan everything, execute it on site. And then we, in the back end would just deal with the billing and the contracting and things like that. Were you ever nervous, like letting go of the, like I feel like at some level keys to the kingdom because people come to you because you're you. And now there's an assistant there. There's a slight difference in personality, a slight difference in preferences and style. Did that concern Absolutely. you? Absolutely. I am a huge control freak. And the thought of somebody else running an entire wedding with like basically my business's name on the line was terrifying. So um, the thing that we did and what we continue to do still is hire from within. So we hire assistants mm -hmm. every season during busy season. We always need extra hands on site in the office um, to help our, our lead planners out. And so the ones that show promise, that are excited, that are on time and motivated, they're the ones that we will train to take on their own events. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of clarity on expectations. They've had a lot of hands-on experience with our planners, our trained planners. So it's a really smooth transition into taking their own events. Um, but those first few were, were definitely nerve wracking. And one bad event is your reputation in the wedding industry. And it's hard to, hard to get back, you know, it's a day for us, you know, we do weddings all the time, but for this couple, they get one shot at it, maybe, maybe two or three, but typically, <laughs> typically one shot. And so if something goes wrong at their wedding, they're never going to forget about it. And they're definitely not going to be happy. How'd you go transitioning from more service-based work into more product-based work? And when did you start thinking about that? So, um, let's see, we started Bridal Bliss in 2002. I brought on um, a girl named Elizabeth Kaur at the time, and that was in 2009. Um, is that right? Yeah, 2009. And she helped expand the team into two different markets, so Seattle and Ben, Central Oregon, Washington. So we have three different offices now. She really took the reins on that. Um, in the middle of all that, I introduced her to my brother-in-law, my husband's brother, and they ended up getting married. And so then we were related. So from that point, we, um, we'd meet regularly all the time for work, for play. And one night we went out to cocktails and we were commiserating to each other about how we felt like we were babysitting our clients. We were constantly reminding them to um, send in their contract to make their payment. And it was, it was like babysitting and it was really frustrating. So we set out to find software that existed that we could just incorporate into the company. And we tried literally everything available to us on the market. And, um, none of the tools really understood the wedding industry. The industry is kind of like construction where there's three key players. There's the couple getting married. There is the supplier, like the florist or the caterer, someone providing a, a service or a product. And then there's the general contractor that's like, that's the wedding planner. So we oversee all of those. And so many times the planner is left out of communication. So like a contract is sent directly from the caterer to the client. Well, as the planner, we don't get a copy of it. We don't get to see it. We don't know when an invoice is paid, so we're totally left out and it causes confusion and 
frustration for both uh, of the other sides. And so after we tried everything, it was clear that what we wanted didn't exist. And um, we set out to hire a developer just to create something in-house for us to use at Bridal Bliss. We had no intention of creating a software company. But the more people we talked to, the more developers we discussed the idea with, um, we were very naive at the time, had no idea how much development costs and how long it takes and what's included in the whole process. So once we did, we kind of just put everything on hold. It was a lot of money. We weren't sure. It definitely wasn't worth it to do it just for Bridal Bliss. And we started talking to our friends in the industry about it. Different planners throughout the country, all different vendor types. And everyone would say, gosh, I don't have never heard of something like that. But if you figure it out, let me know, because I would definitely want to utilize it. Well, that came up pretty much any time we talked to somebody. And so we spent months and months doing research, doing focus groups. And so we decided to launch the product. So we launched at the very end of 2019. Uh, there's a big wedding convention. And so it was kind of our big, like, you know, coming out party, welcome to the world, rock, paper, coin. And um, then COVID hit. So it was actually a huge blessing and a curse at the same time. We, um, we transact contracts, but we also transact invoices on the platform. And obviously so many wedding vendors throughout the country weren't doing business. They weren't doing any, or they were doing a much, much reduced amount for uh, just because of COVID and all of the restrictions. However, they had the time to incorporate new software in their company and COVID forced a lot of companies to digitize their processes. Um, the wedding industry mm -hmm. is, was, is in the dark ages where vendors will at times send out a contract as a word doc, or they'll require that a check is sent in. And couples getting married today, they have zero patience for that. They want everything done quickly. They want it done conveniently. And finding a check is not like an option for them. So those vendors that were requiring that were forced to find a solution. So their potential clients and their current clients could pay them quickly and um, like in a touchless experience. It mind boggles me that it's 2021 and I still come across businesses who are like, oh yeah, you need a fax today. I was like, I don't have I a fax machine. It literally <laughs> every day I talk to vendors that are still, are still doing it. It's a lot of yeah. small businesses and they're so worried. <laughs> if they're so worried about the transaction fees and things like that. Well, at Rock, Paper, Coin, it's only two and a half percent. It's way, way less than Stripe or PayPal or any of those. So once they kind of hear that, they're a little more interested. Mm -hmm. But this, just the idea of ramping up on new software for the um, creative industry scares them. Um, you know, they're in the industry to to do their art, to design flowers, to create invitations, not to send contracts and invoices. And, you know, long ago, software was really complicated and there was no support and you had to learn it on mm -hmm. your own. Whereas today, you know, we have member success managers, tutorials, you know, there's always someone to support you, not only with rock, paper, coin, but most software that's, that's built today. So it's a much easier ramp up than people think. They're just kind of intimidated by transferring everything on and getting started and getting their team embedded. But once they do, the common thing we hear is, man, I wish I did this earlier. Like, why did I wait so long to do this? So we're on a mission to get the wedding industry digitized. <laughs> You mentioned a conference. I'm actually like heading to a conference next week for software. Like what was your splash in that wedding conference space? Like, did you host a event? Did you host a booth? Like what was your way of like spreading the word about uh, rock, paper, coin? Yeah, we had actually two booths that were spread out in different areas of the conference. And um, it was in Vegas. It's the biggest wedding specific conference every year. And it was in Vegas. And so we played off that a little bit and we handed out, you know, everyone gives out like swag. Well, ours was a hangover kit. So it was like a water and Advil and, you know, what you need if you're out on the town in Vegas. And so that actually got our name out pretty quickly. People would be like, oh, make sure mm. you get a hangover kit from Rock, Paper, Coin. We're going to need it. And then they would come and check out our booth and get a quick demo and, um, 
So that was the first conference we ever did. Um, it's actually the only just because of COVID, but we are going back in about a month and a half and um, kind of a similar idea, but our, our booth will be more built out and we'll have reps there that can give demos. We have like giveaways and things like that. Um, but it's just a great way to connect. And then you also get the list of attendees so you can contact them after the fact. It's just another touch point to try to, um, you know, build up the, the info. So I recognize a lot of things from from having an idea to execution is like there's like a really wide gap, but you chose to fill, you chose to close that gap. Um, you didn't need to hire an engineer. You could have done everything manually, but you did anyways. And then once you did that, you realized, hey, we can offer this for other people. But you also, not only did you identify the opportunity, you went after it. Like, what do you feel like, what, what do you feel like is the thing inside you that makes you very open to pursuing new ideas, despite the fact that it's not necessarily in your core realm of like comfort? Yeah, I think um, with Bridal Bliss, it came naturally to me. I loved events. There was not a lot of competition. It happened quickly. I succeeded pretty early on and it kind of, I was able to build business really quickly. It was just me, however. Now with Rock, Paper, Coin, it was Elizabeth and myself that did it. And honestly, if we hadn't done it together, I don't think it would even exist because it's mm. such a huge help um, and inspiration really to have someone along with you for the ride, or at least like another entrepreneur that you can connect with and bounce ideas off of because it's a hard road starting a company. And like when Elizabeth was up, I was down and vice versa. And we would really lift each other and you're not the only one that has to make these big decisions. So um, I would say like starting a company with a co-founder is like, the way I would absolutely do it. And if I could have could go back and do that with Bridal Bliss, I would. And then as a, what about like diving into these new territory? Like you've obviously done sales for your own company mm -hmm. and you've had to do marketing, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the sales methodologies may differ from different niches of business. Like for example, you can't dedicate like, I don't know, the same number of hours going to meet each vendor in the world of software in the same way you could for in-person events. Right. Uh, how, how do you start diving into the different ways of handling different styles of business? Well, you know, it's interesting with, I don't know if this is a COVID thing or just how things are right now, but it's hard to get a hold of people right now. People, especially in the industry, mm -hmm. there's been this huge boom where there are all these 2020 postponements that went into 2021, all the 2021 weddings, and then people booking for next year. So vendors are just underwater. Well, um, whether they're underwater or not, we still have to bring on new members to our platform. So we've had to really change up what was working before in contacting people to get a hold of them now. So really just trying different things. I mean, I'd be lying if I, if I said we weren't just throwing things on the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, but it's, once something does stick, you can really hone in on it and perfect it. So what worked for us in January is totally different than what's working for us today. Do you mind if I ask you to elaborate on what's working today? Yeah, so we have different drip campaigns and most of our communication before was through email, getting a hold of someone, they would bite and we would do a demo and then they'd sign up and be on their, on their way to their member success manager. Where now vendors email at emails inboxes are just like full. And so to get a sales email, that's going to be the first thing that they're going to ignore. So we have actually brought on so many new members in the last few months through contacting them through social media, just direct messaging, mm -hmm. um, being like, your, your work is so beautiful. I can tell you're busy. Um, I'd love to do a demo. Rock, paper, coin can save you money and time, which we absolutely do. So once people hear that, they just have to see it and then their ears will perk up a mm -hmm. little bit. And then once we do pretty quick demos, really basic demos, so they get the general idea of what we do. And then we also do white glove onboarding. So once they sign up, their member success manager can set up their entire account for them. So we personalize it. We add in all of their social media. We set up their pay to account. We get it all dialed and then we can walk them through everything and give them a more detailed um, kind of lesson on how to utilize the application. Okay. What were some of the fears that you had 
when you first started diving into this lesser known like entrepreneurship domain and how do you feel about those fears now um my biggest fear was i mean failure is always a fear right but for for me it was also letting down our investors because some of them are close friends and clients that we've become close with that really believed in us and the product before it even existed so um, you know, obviously you don't want to fail period, but you also don't want to fail for these people that put faith in you right. and, um, you know, put their, their money on, on the line. And, um, obviously not everything makes it, but so far so good. And, um, so that's part of the inspiration too, is to just, um, you know, prove to them that it was worth it and, and mm -hmm. kind of, you know, do good. How did you feel about those fears as more time went on? Like, did you become more confident or did you get like more stress from having the sensation of more weight? No, I would say I'm definitely more confident. Um, you know, the, the application is up and running. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. We're increasing transactions every single month. So our investors are happy. Our team is happy. Um, so we kind of just need to keep the momentum up. So as long as, um, you know, we're feeling good about the progress, then, then I'm going to feel confident if at any point it starts to go downhill and we're not able to reduce it or to change it and fix it, then that'll be a different conversation. And speaking of investors, how do you find your investors beyond the like personal contacts and clients that you were working yeah, with? Yeah, good question. So we are third co-founder was a past client that I've worked with for years and years. I planned her wedding, all of her company and, and personal events. So I knew her well. Um, the next investor was also a past bridal client, bridal bliss client that had worked with both Elizabeth and myself personally. So um, he was on, on board very early on. And then um, the, the next round of his investments was kind of a combination of groups. So our biggest investor is a, a venture fund down in San Francisco and they heard about us or they were introduced to us through another past client of Bridal Bliss who she was planning her wedding. She works for a big fund in San Francisco and we were just too early for her, but she loved the experience. She loved how it saved her time. And she introduced us to, to our venture group and they, um, they bit obviously, and our, our lead investor and something that I, um, didn't really understand beforehand. I was kind of nervous about bringing on investors. I just thought they'd be like breathing down our throats and, um, you know, making us make decisions or things that we didn't necessarily agree with. Well, it's been kind of the opposite experience. We have a standing call with them, a standing Zoom every week where they're just there to support. So we can ask questions, they'll give us advice and suggestions, and they've introduced us to so many great people um, that it's really been invaluable. And, and when they came on as a lead investor, a lot of other groups um, became official too. So we had a couple like local funds, a couple angel investors, just to round out the, uh, the race. What were some of the thing? What are some of the insights you got from working with investors that you didn't expect you'd get? Um, just the connections, just the people to talk to. Mm -hmm. Like for example, we run all of our payments through Stripe. Well, our investor is friends with one of the you know first key groups that started at Stripe. So he was able to introduce us to the people there, reduce our rates. Um, you know, hmm. really important things that has helped our bottom line. So it's, it's the people and the introductions. And as we go into our next round, they are going to make that process a lot easier for us. That's neat. D was the process of like figuring out like cap tables in the sort and like figuring out the legal and financial details, like stressful to you oh. or did you like, it is what it is. I'm just going along with no, it. No fundraising was brutal. Um, you know, and Elizabeth and I, we know weddings, we know marketing, we know sales, we know building a team. We don't know tech. We don't know fundraising, you know, cap tables. That was all foreign to us. So it's really been mm. a huge, huge learning curve. And we have some great people that are ad advisors to us that we can ask for advice and suggestions, but it's still, you have to learn the terminology. You have to know the right people to talk with. You have to have confidence as you're presenting and be able to answer these questions. And I think a part of the difficulty in fundraising for us 
is that we were mostly presenting to like middle-aged men that had gotten married so long ago or uh, their kids weren't old enough to be married. So it wasn't like, it wasn't a problem for them or one that they could think of in their own experience in any time around when we were presenting. So there was a lot of education on just how the world turns in the wedding industry. So half of the pitch was just education. And then we would go into the numbers and the problem and our solution and and all of that. So it was brutal. We would present to anyone that would listen to us. At one point, there was a group in Istanbul that wanted us to present. So that with the time difference, it was like midnight our time. And so we were... We were just trying to stay awake to do the pitch and, you know, it's early morning for them. So it's just a different, different experience, but it honestly was kind of nice to, to fundraise during COVID because we could do it all via Zoom. So we didn't have to travel a ton and waste time going back and forth to San Francisco or wherever the potential investor was. We could just do it from wherever we were, which, which was a, a huge blessing. Do you know how many pitches you did? Or have done. Oh my God, fifty! I, I okay. don't even know so many. <laughs> I also noticed that uh, based on your LinkedIn profile, you spend—I'm um, assuming—a non-trivial amount of time in volunteering. Yeah. Can you tell me how you fit that in with two companies? And I'm assuming things like I don't know, capital raises also drain a lot of your time and energy. For sure. And I, I think I heard you previously also have a family. So there's there's definitely a lot of juggling <laughs> responsibility. That you've done. There's a lot of juggling. I have two kids. I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. So that is a whole nother job in itself. But thankfully, we have a lot of really amazing family support. Um, and my husband has a flexible job as well. So we're able to make that happen. Um, as far as volunteering, honestly, I used to volunteer my time a lot more. There's a really great group, a local group here in Portland called Leve, and it's um, it was created by a group of young women who just wanted to give back, and they love to party. And so we would throw these mm. big, extravagant parties every holiday season, and it was all for charity. So we wanted to have a good time, and we wanted to give back, and it's grown year over year. Um, and my oldest was a, a preemie. He was born two months early. He was three pounds. He's totally healthy now, but, um, you know, that's a, an area that's near and dear to my heart as well. So those are, mm. are kind of two areas that, that I like to support right now. It's honestly just financially that I'm able to, to help until I get a little more time, but at bridal bliss, they also send out gifts to all of the vendors every year. It ends up being like 600 vendor gifts. And part of that is a donation to a local nonprofit. So, um, yeah. you know, we've done local food banks. We do um, sock drives to try to help the local community, just like little things like that. Um, but people really appreciate seeing, seeing that. And honestly, they'd probably rather get that as a gift than a little trinket that they're going to throw away. That's actually really cool. I have not considered that, but now I'll have to add that to yeah. my uh, list of ideas. Did you get, did you see the idea from somewhere else or did you come up with it yourself? No, I think we just came up with it a couple years ago and okay. it got such a great response that we've continued with it. The, uh, the next question I want to ask you is like, what's something you've been learning in call it the recent one year that you wish you knew like many years ago as an entrepreneur? Oh my gosh. Um, honestly, just having the confidence. Um, and I also think setting boundaries is something that I've gotten a lot better at. I, especially with wedding planning, you become friends with these people and you're kind of at their beck and call and some really take advantage yeah. of it. So, you know, okay. shutting off at a certain time, being available at a certain time. Um, I'd say that's something, but also, you know, the older you get, the more experiences you have, the more confidence you're going to have as well. So, um, yeah, I think as a, a, a lesson that I learned early on that has stuck with me is, is that kind of the world turns on relationships. So the more people, mm. you know, the more people you can, um, you know, kind of have your back and you have their back, it's only going to serve you. So especially with weddings, when I first started, um, trying to really 
pay attention to those relationships and check in with people and not only contact them when I wanted something, but to really form a friendship. Um, that has served me very well from Bright Up List through Rock, Paper, Coin and just life in general. What, do you have certain like action items or philosophies that you'd recommend people who are trying to build up their network of relationships? Um, I think just what I said in that you have to really spend time on a relationship. So even though you meet someone, you hit it off, you have to keep up with that. So don't only contact them when you want something. There has right, to right. be a, you help me, I help you. Um, community over competition is so important right now. And that's a huge change from when I first started in the wedding industry. It hmm. was kind of you against the world when it came to your certain uh, vendor type. Nobody chatted, nobody shared secrets, nobody helped each other. Um, whereas now I, there's, you know, a ton of different planners I could call locally and say, Hey, I need a last minute assistant this weekend. Do you have anyone? Whereas, you know, 15, 20 years ago, that was, you would not even consider doing that. It's so interesting how fast some things can change in the working world. Like, I think it's almost across every scenario I've seen in a case study, like cooperation mm -hmm. is significantly better for everyone involved, uh, versus competition. Yeah, And the thing is. Um, and this, I think in many industries is very similar is that there's a lot of business to go around and a company can only take so much. So when we're booked at Bridal mm -hmm. Bliss, we're going to send, um, referrals to people that we like and are going to take care of our clients. And, um, so, you know, sure you might be friendly just to be nice, but it's also going to serve you in the end. There's no reason to be catty or be a shark or, or, you know, be against your, your competition. It's, it's going to hurt you more than it's going to help. There's this book called the go giver that I think really oh. changed my paradigm around this philosophy. I'm like, Oh, like in giving more, it's not like you don't give with the intention and desire right. of wanting to get something in return. You just give because it's the right thing to do. And surprisingly, more often than you would think, it comes back to you, maybe not in the short term, but eventually in the long term, I, I think it's the, the like the best strategy you can do. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And actually, I have a story that goes along with that. Um, we we always respond to every email and, and every phone call, whether we can help the person, whether it's someone that's just trying to pitch their business, which we get a lot of those, but we always respond. And... Um, there was a, a girl that had reached out several years ago for a job and um, we were we were fully staffed at the time and I wrote her back and I said, thank you, we're fully staffed here, are a couple other planners you might wanna reach out to um, and I didn't hear back from her. And then like just a couple years ago, she hired us to plan her wedding and she goes, I knew when I got married that I was going to hire you because you were the only person that got back to me and you were so helpful even though um, you know, you were, you were fully booked. So, you know, that's hmm. not why I responded by any means. Right, I right, remember, right, right. <laughs> I remember being young and trying to get a job and having that same experience and it's frustrating. And I, I remember saying to myself, like, I will, I will never do that to somebody else. And it's ended up mm. serving randomly. Cool. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed this conversation a lot. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to give you the floor now. For the people who are interested in following you personally or your company's journey, uh, what's the best way for them to do so? Sure. So we're on social media. We Our handle is uh, Rock Paper Coin on Facebook and Instagram. And email is probably the best way to get a hold of me. I'm just Nora at rockpapercoin.com. And if you are accepting digital payments or uh, virtual contracts, we'd love to have you try us out. I'm happy to give you a personal demo, um, a discount for a free year. Just reach out and I will take care of you. Sounds good. Thanks again, Nora. Thank you.